<laughs> you know guys yesterday i was watching the news and i was watching that debate between the anc da and the eff when they were talking about the provincial power bill i think at this point the da has made their point very clear they want to keep independence and they are pushing for the provincial power bill so listening to this debate i was paying attention especially to the african national congress and the eff i was listening to the response that the, the eff and the anc was going to give you know guys one thing that i've realized is that it's fine anc and the eff they can oppose to western cape independence anc and the da they can oppose to the provincial power bill you know right now they are going around saying <laughs> the da wants to create another orania we are not going to allow the da to create another orania in this democracy in south africa it's a one country we are not going to allow this cape independence and this whole thing of a provincial power bill man it is not constitutional i mean the constitution is on our side the anc and the eff man the constitution is on our side the one conversation that was never heard on that interview or debate rather it is the cause of this conversation the cause of this conversation i mean whether we like it or not at some point we really have to talk about why is the da pushing for the provincial power bill and why is the da pushing for the western cape independence i think that is one conversation that the anc don't want to have and i also think that is one conversation that the D, the, the eff has actually failed to take advantage of because right now in south africa I man if we're going to have a situation where there's a political party that is pushing for a western cape independence a political party that is pushing for the provincial power bill we really need to look at the root cause of this conversation and i think if we start looking at the root cause of this conversation the blame will go to the african national congress because if the anc was doing an amazing job in terms of governing the country there would be no need for us to have a conversation about the provincial power bill there would be no need for us to have a conversation about the western cape independence people right now men have started to give up on the south african voters people are starting to give up on the south african voters I mean, some people are saying guys whether you like it or not there are a lot of uneducated voters in south africa majority of the voters in south africa are people who love identity politics who love racial politics and these are the kinds of people I mean, that will always vote for the african national congress no matter what the african national congress do so what are we going to do to make sure that we don't live in the same world as these people what are we going to do so we are going to push for the western cape independence and we are going to push for the provincial power bill because the nc has actually failed to govern the country so why didn't the eff actually take advantage of this conversation why is not the eff attacking the african national congress and saying guys do you see what you are doing right now do you see that the country is, is such a mess that right now you have the democratic alliance actually talking about the western cape independence i mean if the da would be talking about the cape independence when the country was running well everyone was gonna say all of you guys there in the western cape you are crazy all of you guys in the da you are insane there is no need for the country to have the western cape independence because everything is still fine in the country but not everything is still fine in the country and you look at the voters of the country man you have to be realistic is that the voters of this country man they are uneducated the voters of this country man they love the african national congress no matter what the anc do so how many people men are actually going to sit there and be subjected to this rule of the african national congress simply because the majority of the people men are love the african national congress why is no one talking about the root cause of this conversation I feel like many political parties they are failing to take this matter man, and actually blame the African National Congress and say guys this is your mistake the reason why today we are talking about Western Cape independence the reason why today we are talking about the provincial power bill it is because the ANC has failed to govern the country the ANC has failed to govern the country now we are allowing the ANC to go around in the media pretending to be the better one ANC saying that nah the DA is just a racist party they want to turn the Western Cape into another Orania and as the African National Congress we are not going to allow that man no one is saying to the African National Congress man why is that conversation being had at the first place why is that conversation being had and i'm hearing no one man all of these political parties no one is saying guys the reason why the da is pushing for all of these policies is because the African National Congress is doing a terrible job in terms of running the country the, the African National Congress is doing a terrible job in terms of running the country. Right now, the same ANC man has been pushing for the 30%. For how long? 
ANC has been pushing for 30% for how long? Man, right now you have a lot of uneducated people in the country. You have a lot of people, man, who are not even interested in politics. And the people who are interested, man, in politics are people who love identity politics, who love racial politics. So at some point, man, these people, man, you have to realize that they are not going to vote better. They are not going to vote better, not because they don't want to, because they are incapable of voting better, because they are not educated enough to vote better. That's why right now the ANC is going around telling people that, guys, if you vote for another political party, they are going to take away your social grants. That is what the ANC is telling the people right now, that if you vote for another political party, they are going to take the social grants. And guess what? The people actually believe the African National Congress when they say that, guys, if you vote for another political party, they are going to take your social grants. So it really proves to you what kind of voters we have in South Africa. It tells you what kind of people we have in South Africa. So guys, do you, do you actually blame the DA for actually wanting Cape independence? Do you blame the DA and the people in the Western Cape for saying, guys, we are sick and tired of South Africa. We are sick and tired of the South African voters to vote for this party no, no matter what they do. We are sick and tired. Because as much as some people want to portray the DA as this party that wants to break down the country, we really have to look at the African National Congress and say, guys, the reason why you have people calling for the Western Cape independence is because you guys have failed to, go to govern the country. You failed to govern the country. No one is having that conversation, man. No political party is talking about this. No political party is talking about this. So, guys, anyway... <laughs> Anyway, today I want us to look at this interview for by President Ramaphosa. I mean, you know, President Ramaphosa is someone who doesn't do a lot of interviews, man. I think the president team I mean, is trying to shield him of some responsibility in the country because it doesn't matter what happens in the country, man. The biggest story can break in the country, man. And President Ramaphosa will say nothing. President Ramaphosa would say nothing, man. Even the scandals revolving him, he would say nothing, man. So it's it's nice to see the president out and about. I see. I saw that he had an interview an interview with the SABC, and he also had an interview with the Newsroom Africa. And this is the interview that I want us to watch. A lot of people, man, were not happy about this interview because they felt like President Ramaphosa was dodging the questions. So, guys, I want us to go through this interview and tell me what you think about this interview between President Ramaphosa and Newsroom Alive was the earlier address by the SG of the ANC, who is also at Virtue Hotel. Let's take you live there now where a News from Africa reporter, uh, Zian Dangobo, is uh, sending by with the African National Congress President, Sir Ramaphosa. Mapolo, it's over to you. A very good evening to you, Tab. Indeed, we're at the Birchard Hotel, and I'm seated with President Cyril Ramaphosa, who will be having a wide-ranging interview with us, Mr. President. A big day for the African National Congress in the sense that, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's the first time that you've actually had to suspend a president uh, because of what you have termed basically ill-discipline. Yes, it is the first time that... Uh the ANC in recent times has had to do so. Uh, it is the most unfortunate action that uh, the NEC has had to take to suspend uh, Jacob Zuma. Uh, you know, guys, talking about Jacob Zuma, eh? talking about Jacob Zuma, <laughs> every time when I see Jacob Zuma, and the African National Congress, man. Every time I see these people, man, I see their feud, I cannot help but think these people are going to go into coalition after the elections. Every time. Nothing tells me that the African National Congress is serious about Jacob Zoom. Nothing. Nothing. When I look at this whole scenario between Jacob Zuma and the African National Congress, man, I think this is a whole concoction. Because what is happening right now, even in the media space, the African National Congress and the MK party, man, they are consuming all the time. The media right now is not talking about other political parties. The media right now, they are obsessed about Jacob Zuma and President Ramaphosa. And these people, man, it is not good that they are taking all the media time going into the elections. Because South Africans, man, right now, as we speak, South Africans are thinking that this whole election is based on the African National Congress and the MK party. It's based on the African National Congress and the MK party. And the fear that I have is that after the elections, the MK party will go into coalition with African National Congress. And this whole thing of a coalition will just be a talk because at the end of the day, the African National Congress will be running everything. Even if you look at the media right now, 
parties like the EFF, it's almost as if the EFF is taking a backseat. It's almost as if the, D the EFF is taking the backseat because no one is talking about the EFF. No one is talking about anything that the EFF is doing right now. Everyone is obsessed about the Jacob Zuma rallies. Everyone is obsessed about Jacob Zuma I mean, attacking ANC at every single turn. And now you see that President Ramaphosa, I mean, it's almost as if his team told him that Ramaphosa, you need to, you need to stop being a gentleman. You need to start hitting a Jacob Zoom. Right now, the interviews that you are seeing from President Ramaphosa, whenever President Ramaphosa speaks on the media, at first, President Ramaphosa would not mention Jacob Zuma by name. He would not mention Jacob Zuma by name, but recently, President Ramaphosa, ever since the January 8th statement, even if you listen to that uh, speech of Ramaphosa during the January 8th statement, that whole speech, man, was a political speech. It was a political speech and he was already campaigning for the African National Congress. And when you listen to that speech and when you listen to how strong Ramaphosa sounds on that whole thing, Ramaphosa's team told him that, guys, we are sick and tired of Jacob Zuma. We are sick and tired of Jacob Zuma men attacking you and you always act, have to be act like a better person. Right now, when you go out, you need to start addressing Jacob Zuma. You need to start hitting back at MK. So what it does is that, man, the media gets obsessed about these two entities. They are forgetting about all other political parties. They're forgetting about all other political parties. So I have a fear that the South Africans are going into these elections. They are going to think that the whole election is basing on the ANC versus the MK party. They are going to think the ANC versus the MK party. I know there are many people who said that, guys, this whole MK party, it is going to destroy the Afghan National Congress. But I honestly think this whole MK party, it is going to destroy the EFF. I think it is going to destroy the EFF because not many people are actually talking about the EFF right now. Not many people are talking about the EFF right now. And you know you have people, man, who followed Julius Malema because they hated Jacob Zuma. Because they hated Jacob Zuma, man. And some people, man, actually followed Julius Malema because they hated President Ramaphosa. When they see Jacob Zuma, man, coming back into the political space, they are going back to Jacob Zuma. They are going back to Jacob Zuma, man. Even some of the members within the African National Congress, these people, man, who hated President Ramaphosa, they are now declaring their support for the MK party. <laughs> So guys, I have a fear that the South Africans are being gullible as they are going into the elections. When they are going to think that this whole election, it is based on the ANC versus the MK party. And there is no such thing as the ANC versus the MK party. Guys, these people are going to go into coalition. Mm -hmm. <laughs> these people are going to go into coalition. Of what you have termed basically mm -hmm. ill discipline. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is the first time that uh, uh, the ANC in recent times has had to do so. Uh, it is the most unfortunate action that uh, the NEC has had to take to suspend uh, Jacob Zuma uh, from his membership of the ANC because of uh, sec exceptional circumstances which we are entitled to. Uh, to do in terms of the constitution of the ANC. Most unfortunate indeed, but it had to be done uh, because of uh, the manner in which uh, he was deporting himself uh, and we have dubbed it anti-revolutionary, anti uh, counter-revolutionary rather, and um, the ANC, NEC, uh, took this decision after much debate and discussion. How much responsibility is the ANC willing to take for what many would say the monster that you created? On many an occasion, the ANC has defended former President Jacob Zuma <laughs> to the extent that you've been criticized, that you place the ANC above the needs of the country. Well, I guess uh, in any situation like this, there is quite a lot of uh, analysis and uh, uh, self-introspection that has to be done. The ANC itself has to do that. And uh, yes, uh, in doing so, we've got to also look at the various steps that we took and missteps uh, on the way to where we are today. So the ANC has a lot uh, to discuss within our own ranks about how this has come about. But certainly our analysis and our conclusion is that this is a counter-revolutionary 
uh, act that uh, we believe that he has taken and uh, that's why the NEC felt that uh, we have to take the suspension route uh, in dealing with him. But, <laughs> but the president is not answering the question. Many, the question was like the question revolved around the, the responsibility that the African National Congress is taking for creating Jacob Zoom. The president, many, you know, you, you know, President Ramaphosa, many, Ramaphosa is slimy. Ramaphosa is slimy, many. You must not listen to Ramaphosa, many. You, you, you even ahead, you remember Tito Mboweni saying that many. If you have a conversation with Ramaphosa, this man will change your mind. <laughs> You must not have a conversation with Ramaphosa, man. This man is a very talented snake oil salesman, man. He's a very talented snake oil salesman. Because right now, the, the, like, the question was revolved around what kind of responsibility does the ANC take in terms of creating Jacob Zuma. Ramaphosa is not addressing that. <laughs> and how concerned are you, Mr. President, as you go into your election campaign about the province of KwaZulu-Natal with the existence of the Sumkonto Wesizwe party against the backdrop of KwaZulu Natal and Gauteng counting for about 40% of your overall uh, vote and uh, the popularity of your former president, who you've of course today suspended? Well, there are going to be about 350 uh, or so parties that are going to be contesting these elections. Yeah. So this is a new addition yeah. uh, against the many others, so 349. Uh, so, why is Ramaphosa so delighted when he talks about these 350 political parties that have actually registered to campaign? Why is Ramaphosa so happy to talk about the fact that we have over 350 political parties? Man? Why is he so happy about that? <laughs> you know, last time when I was reporting about this thing of the IEC registering over 350 political parties, man, many people said that Thomas. This whole thing is a ploy from the African National Congress. It is a ploy from the African National Congress because for the longest time, people were talking about the, 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 the coalition between the ANC and the DA and the ANC and the EFF. But with the additional 350 political parties, man, the ANC doesn't have to go into coalition with the, with the DA or the EFF anymore. They can take 20 of these political parties and say, guys, we know you don't have a lot of votes, but if we take 20 of you guys, man, we combine your percentages, man, we can actually go into governance with you. And these political parties are nobody. Nobody knows of these political parties. <laughs> so guess what? The African National Congress, man, there's still a huge chance that these people, man, will be running the country after these elections. And I can tell you today, if the ANC is going to govern the country again for the five more years, the country is done. South Africa is done, man. If ANC is going to campaign again, South Africa is done. Uh, we are not concerned, we are confident as the African National Congress that uh, the people of South Africa still love the African National Congress, they still identify themselves with us and of course every party that is contesting does believe that they have support and uh, in our case it has been proven support over the past 30 years and so we go into these elections with a great deal of confidence and great assurance uh, that we are going to emerge victorious. We are not deterred by you know, someone's popularity or whatever or history. Uh, we go forward as the African National Congress, confident that our people uh, who have always supported the ANC will do so in their large numbers mm -hmm. and will even do so much more now as they see all these uh, you know things happening mm -hmm. <laughs> you know the reason why Ramaphosa is so confident <coughs> it is because of the messaging that the African National Congress is going into, in, into the elections with you know every time when the president says that if you vote for another political party you are going to lose your social grounds I mean like guys this is like, this is the bargaining chip from the African National Congress. They know that, man, we had to save this card for when things are really bad. And right now, things are really bad for the ANC. And they are going out with the most desperate messaging. So when Ramaphosa says, man, South Africans still love the African National Congress, he's not telling a lie. He's not telling a lie, man. I wish I could sit here and say that, President Ramaphosa, you are lying. South Africans don't love the African National Congress. But South Africans love the ANC. Wherever where the ANC goes, the people go. Wherever where the people go, 
wherever where ANC goes, people go. No one has ever protested against the African National Congress. No one has ever protested an event that was held by the African National Congress. If anything, people are welcoming the African National Congress with warm hands. <laughs> It's insane. I mean, like, when you really think about it, man, it's insane. It's insane, man. No matter, like, with these people's track record, that is there for everyone to see. People, for some reason, they still follow the African National Congress. They still follow the African National Congress, man. And when President says, man, a lot of people still love the ANC, he's not telling a lie. He's not telling a lie, man. Like, if you could start having conversation with average South Africans, man, people will tell you that, yeah, I'm listening to these other opposition parties. But when I get to the booth, I'm going to vote for the ANC. I'm going to vote for the ANC. People are saying that, man, rather the devil we know or <laughs> than the devil we don't know. Rather the devil we know than the devil we don't know. That's why people, when it comes to this whole thing of social grants, it doesn't matter what other political parties are saying. People are saying, man, the ANC is already giving us the social grants. So there's no need for us to vote for these political parties that are already promising us social grants. President Ramaphosa told us that if we vote for these guys, they are going to scrap our social grants. And the ANC right now is giving us social grants. So we are going to vote for our social grants. We are going to vote for our social grants. So Ramaphosa knows that half of the countrymen, 30 million South Africans are depending on social grants. Ramaphosa knows that if the ANC intensifies this messaging that if you vote for other political party, you are not going to get your social grants. If ANC intensifies that messaging, the ANC is going to get a lot of support into these elections. You are going to see more people turning out to the polls. Don't be there thinking that, yeah, it is good we are taking out the African National Congressmen. Those will be the people that who didn't care about voting. But when they hear the president talking about their social grants, these people men, will be motivated to go to the polls. They will be motivated to go to the polls. And you can see with Ramaphosa, with this messaging and the addition of 350 political parties, he's quite confident that the ANC is going to win the elections again. He's quite confident. Today, Mr. President, when you were opening the Lakota, you spoke about recovery, rebuilding, and of course, renewal. Some would say <laughs> that this process of renewal is disingenuous to the extent that when we talk about corruption, there are still many allegations uh, and issues that have not been dealt with. Whether you talk about, um, you know, some NEC members who were implicated in the state capture report, in recent times, Mr. President, in fact, the DA has called for you to sign a proclamation for the SIU to investigate your own deputy president. Uh, the Palapala matter, one would argue, that is still hanging over your head and people don't believe the outcomes of the various reports. What would you say to South Africans who are saying, well, this is just a lie? Well, many South Africans uh, do believe that we are a movement and a renewal, that we are moving forward. <laughs> Did you hear that, guys? <laughs> Just a lie. Well, many South Africans uh, do believe that we are a movement and a renewal. That do you believe that the ANC is in the process of the renewal, like the president is saying? Do you believe that, guys? Please tell me in the comment section, do you believe that the ANC is in the process of renewal? <laughs> we are moving forward to renew ourselves. And in terms of the various processes that we are going through as a movement ourselves, and of course we've always said that any form of corruption if it is proven, we will act. And that is why we, we adopted a rule that says, once you are charged, once you are charged, you have to step aside. And for us, that is a real uh, moment of great decision. And of course, those who were named in the Zondo report, We've acted, we've said they're either going to be disciplined if they didn't go to the Integrity Commission to explain themselves, and uh, the Zondo Commission process is still underway in terms of the various investigations and where people need to be charged when they are charged they will step aside. Mr. President, can I jump in there? How does the step aside work when in Eteguini you have, uh, you know, the current chairperson but former mayor Zandile Komete who's on the campaign trail, but she's been charged? She has had to step down from a government executive position. That's what she stepped aside from. 
and indeed for many others the step aside rule ha which is a dynamic and uh, a rule that is going to be reviewed on an ongoing basis uh, is, is, is going to be applied as we move on so we have said that once for instance you are charged you immediately have to step aside from a role where you are in the executive or representing people at a, an executive level and uh, as time goes on we are going to be reviewing that whole process and seeing whether it works well for us or not in the past you might recall the ANC used to say you are uh, uh, you are innocent until proven guilty yes when he says in the past is is talking about Jacob Zuma's administration when he says in the past <laughs> It was Jacob Zuma's administration, but talking about this whole thing of stepping aside, when someone is charged of corruption or when someone is accused of corruption, if the ANC, the best thing they can do is to ask this person to step aside, I mean, like, that is not real accountability. That is not real accountability, man. If you are going to ask people to step aside, if they are charged of corruption or if they are accused of corruption and the government not ensuring that there is accountability, that these people, men are forced to take, then what is the point of stepping aside? What is the point of stepping aside if people are not going to be dragged to courts? What is the point of stepping aside if people are not going to be dragged to jail? What is the point of stepping aside? So telling someone who stole millions from the public, telling them to step aside, you are basically telling this person that man, you can go on vacation with your family because nothing is going to be done to those people. Nothing is going to be done. How many cadres were actually dragged to the courts or dragged to jail? How many cadres are locked up today because of the step aside? So when you tell someone who has been accused of stealing millions and millions of rands, when you are telling that person to step aside, you are basically telling that person to go on vacation. You are telling them to go on vacation. Because even if these people may step aside, after some time, these people may will still be welcomed in the African National Congress. This is the same thing that you are seeing on Deben with, with Zandilo Gumet. This is what you are seeing with Zandilo Gumet. The president is saying that now, nah, Zandile Gumete had to step aside from her government position. I mean, like, nothing was done to Zandile Gumete. Nothing was done to Zandile Gumete. Now, the same Zandile Gumete, who has corruption allegations on top of her, she's campaigning for the African National Congress. She's campaigning for the African National Congress, and the president is saying, nah, the step aside really worked because she had to step down from her government position. What is the point of asking people to step down from their government position if the government is not going to make sure that these people men are held accountable for what they did when they were in government? What is the point? There is no point for this step aside rule. This step aside rule man is nothing but a big joke. Uh, that was the process we followed. Yeah. But like any other organization, we renew our processes and uh, we've moved from that to say once you're charged you must uh, step aside. So with that too, we will be able to review precisely the application of that. Mm. And let's talk then about your work as well in terms of fixing the economy, high unemployment, rampant corruption. Um, besides the COVID-19 pandemic, what would you say you've actually achieved, Mr. President? Because as they've dubbed the Rama, ANC of Ramaphosa, um, <laughs> is failing South Africans in every aspect, whether you're talking about load shedding, whether you talk about high unemployment. What do you think you've actually done? Well, it's, it's, it's not so much what I've done. It's what we have been doing in government and seeking to do to put South Africa on the right footing again. The five years that we've been through have been years of recovery and rebuilding. And, and guys, do you feel like the ANC is recovering or do you feel like the ANC is rebuilding? Also renewal. In the past <laughs> five years, we've faced enormous challenges. One of those was, uh, of course, state capture. <laughs> And what have we done with state capture? We Nothing. stopped state capture in its tracks. Have you, Mr. President? We have uh, what about organizations the against ag your deputy. I mean, like President Ramaphosa is going to sit there and say that we have stopped state capture. What is the evidence? Are you going to present any evidence to the South Africans and say this is the evidence? This is why we are saying we've stopped the state capture because we have the evidence right in front of you. We have the evidence right in front of you, man. If people. Where to talk about the both administration of Jacob Zuma and Ramaphosa? Some people, men, are making compelling arguments that Ramaphosa's administration is more corrupt. 
Some people may not say, man, I never thought that we'd have a worse president than Jacob Zuma. But today we have President Ramaphosa. His administration is more corrupt. So what the hell is he talking about? State capture. <laughs> and what have we done with state capture? We've stopped state capture in his tracks. Have you, Mr. President? We have. Uh, what about organizations the against uh, your deputy president? Uh, organizations such as SARS have been captured. Attempts were made to capture the, the treasury. That was stopped. Organizations or entities such as uh, ESCOM had been captured, Transnet, and we've stopped state capture and we've regained control of those and we are rebuilding them. And that must be seen in good like SARS was gone. And when we came in, we immediately took steps to stop the state capture project uh, from destroying one of our most valued uh, institutions and we've rebuilt the NPA and we're rebuilding also our intelligence services. Stop, don't lie Ramaphosa, don't lie, don't say that the ANC has rebuilt the, ANC, the, the NPA. Don't lie because last time when the Secretary General of the ANC, Fikilam Balula, was at Metro FM, she said that man, the reason why the government hasn't taken any action against all the corrupt politicians. It is because the Ramaphosa administration is still strengthening the NPA. So don't sit there and say that you have fixed the NPA. You didn't fix the NPA. And talking about the NPA, man, this is one of the things that you spoke about very often when you became the president. You said that I mean, one of the first things that my, administ my administ administration is going to do is that we are going to fix the NPA so that we are going to go after all of these corrupt politicians. But five years into your, dem five, five years into your administration, your secretary general is still talking about your administration fixing the NPA. So what has the NPA actually done in the past five years? What is the NPA actually done for the, in the past five years? I mean, right now, if you were to go around and talk with average South Africans, man, they will tell you that NPA is useless. NPA is useless, man. How is it possible that we have you as the president, man, the same person who said that he's going to clean the house, he's going to clean the government, he's going to clean the African National Congress. How is it possible that we still have you as the president and you have corrupt people in your administration? How is it possible that we have corrupt people within your organization? How is it possible that you are still working with the people that were named and shamed in the Zondo Commission? So Ramaphosa sitting there and talking that the NPA... We have, we have fixed the NPA. If you have fixed the NPA, what are the results of you fixing the NPA? How many comrades have actually been dragged to jail and thrown into jail? How many comrades have actually been forced to be accountable for their action by this NPA of yours that you fixed? How many? It's valued uh, institutions. And we've rebuilt the NPA. And we're rebuilding also our intelligence services and all these <laughs> had been captured and corrupted and that should be seen as something that we have done a lot of damage had been wrought or done in this country during that period and as though that was not enough then we had COVID. we dealt with COVID and saved many many lives then we had the unrest in 2021 We've dealt with that we didn't do as well as we should have and we could have been more ready but the weakening of our security structures had been set in motion during the state capture period and that we have also had to rebuild and reposition and you could also talk about the budgetary challenges that for instance the police and the defense force face, because for instance the police had been sort of uh, denuded of even being able to hire more police. Now we have hired 20,000, we are now going to move to 30,000. So that is meaningful change to do what? To deal with criminality. I mean, Ramaphosa, I mean, like right now, at this point, you are simply being disingenuous, man. You are simply being disingenuous. I don't know how many times I'm going to talk about this, but you know, guys, <laughs> you know, sometimes when I talk about the issues and I keep repeating my points, some people will say that, Thomas, when you've been repeating the same point, it is because, guys, it is true. 
a disguise because it is true and we are going into the elections and we cannot ignore the important points simply because we say that we've spoken enough about them we cannot simply ignore issues important issues simply because we've said that okay we've spoken enough about this it doesn't matter if president ramaphosa hires a hundred thousand police officers the, the point is that the south african police service it's a very corrupt institution so it doesn't matter how many police officers you are actually going to hire just because you've hired 20,000 police officers, it doesn't mean that right now you are honestly dealing with corruption. It doesn't mean that right now you are honestly dealing with, with the criminality that is happening in the country. Because if you are not going to fix the South African police service, if you are not going to remove Begi Kele as the police minister, the same, the most incompetent police ministers in South African time, I mean like even Fikile Mbalula was more capable than Begi Kele. If you are not going to remove Begitkel, then it doesn't matter how many people you actually hire. It doesn't matter how many people you actually hire. Guys, Begitkel, I mean, was given a report. <laughs> no, he gave a report that from 2019 to 2022, 5,000 police officers man, were charged with the heinous crimes. 5,000 police officers were charged with the heinous crimes. Guys, I'm talking about robbery. I'm talking about theft. I'm talking about... I'm, like I'm, go, I'm talking about the most horrible crimes, and guess what? Four thousand of these police officers are still the South African police officers. Four thousand of them. So right now, you might be stopped by a police officer in the street, and chances are that person is nothing but a thug. It's nothing but a thug. And Begitkele, when he was asked about this, he said, "I don't know how these people are still the members of the South African police service." He did not say that we are going to act against these four thousand police personnel, and we are going to kick them out. Of the institution because they are, they are they are actually damaging the name of the institution he didn't say that the only thing that he said is that i don't know why four thousand of the police officers men that were accused of heinous crimes are still wearing the south african police service uniform today so it doesn't matter if you hire twenty thousand police officers it doesn't matter if you hire one million police officers if you are not going to fix the south african police service then and then we face the floods in KZN, in the northern and in, in northwest, as well as in the Eastern Cape, that too has required processes of setting aside money, budgets to deal with that. So this period, and then we've had load shedding. Now the yeah. load shedding had its roots from in the ANC-led government in before you as collapsed. early as 1998, and mistakes were made. Yes. We will accept that. Mistakes were made. And as it is in life, mistakes are made. That mistake was made, and we're fixing it. So I'm with how are you fixing it when we are having stage eight of load shedding, stage ten of load shedding? You see, Ramaphosa, what he's trying to do. He says that load shedding it is not our problem. Load shedding it is not our problem, man. This is a problem <laughs> that began a long time ago. So what President Ramaphosa is doing, he's trying to play identity politics. He's trying to, to, to show people, he's trying to say to the people that, guys, the African National Congress is a respectable organization. But it's just that those people, man, during that Zuma's administration, those people, they broke everything down. But my administration is fixing everything that Jacob Zuma is breaking down. He's trying to protect the African National Congress. He's trying to protect the ANC and by playing identity politics. And for some reason, man, some people believe President Ramaphosa. They believe President Ramaphosa. Me, I blame the African National Congress as a whole. I don't care who is the leader of the African National Congress. That's why I'm so harsh on Jacob Zuma. That's why I will never give Jacob Zuma a chance. That's why when people say that, yeah, Jacob Zuma has formed Umkondo Wesizwe, he doesn't want anything to do with the African National Congress. Man, Jacob Zuma has contributed into South Africans' lives being a living hell. Jacob Zuma has contributed when he was the president of the African National Congress. So just because today Jacob Zuma is no longer the president of the African National Congress, it doesn't mean that we must forget about his contributions as the president of the African National Congress. I was saying the same thing about Isma Khashul. I am not going to forget about the contributions of Isma Khashul when he was the member of the African National Congress. Just because today he's running around with his African Congress for Transformation thing, it doesn't mean that his contribution towards the African National Congress are not forgotten it doesn't mean that his contributions are now forgotten so the ANC is something that we really need to get to, go to get rid of we cannot sit here and play that game of saying nah Mbeki's administration was, was better Jacob Zuma's administration was bad Jacob Ramaphosa's administration is worse 
No, we cannot sit here and play that game. We need to get rid of the African National Congress as a whole. I don't care about Tabumbegi. I don't care about Nelson Mandela. We need to get the rid of the party as a whole. Because if we are going to sit here and compare the presidents of the African National Congress, we are always going to vote for the African National Congress. Because I can tell you today, even if Ramaphosa steps down as the, as the president of the African National Congress, this party will get someone that people are attracted to. And people, what will people say? They will say that as much as Ramaphosa was worse, we believe that this new administration is going to do good. They are failing to recognize that all of these people men, are brought to us by the African National Congress. So I'm saying, let's get rid of whole ANC. Let's get rid of whole ANC with, with their leaders. Let's get rid of everything that has to do with the African National Congress. That's why I'm so livid whenever I talk about Jacob Zuma. Man. The fact that the people are honestly trying to give Jacob Zuma another chance, despite this man as, as the president of the African National Congress, despite the record of Jacob Zuma being there as the member of the African National Congress, they wanted to give Jacob Zuma another chance to run the country simply because Jacob Zuma is going against the Ramaphosa. Can you believe that? Can you believe that people are simply trying to give Zuma another chance because he's going against Ramaphosa? It's insane. It's insane. We'll trust you now, Mr. President. Because, because, it's because the same thing what we have, have done, told. what we have been able to do, even some of the mistakes, yes. what has been achieved far outweighs what has been done incorrectly. Because the lives of South Africans have been improved. <laughs> do you believe that, guys? Do you believe that your life has been improved? Past 30 years. And anybody who tells me that nothing has changed in 30 years is not telling the truth. Because Are we not moving backwards? Sometimes it's not about what the statistics say, but what South Africans feel. They don't feel safe. They don't feel, as we straddle between uh, stages two and three of load yes. shedding, they may not feel the improvements that you speak about, Mr. President. I would, I would say if nothing was being done, if nothing, if we were at a standstill and we were not addressing these problems, I would say right they are. But right now, a lot is being done to improve many of the challenges that we face. For instance, with <laughs> load shedding, we would have been in a much worse situation. And a number of countries around the world also experience load shedding. But we are special, and we should not be having load shedding. So that's why we are addressing it. But it is also leading us to embark on another journey to re reform our energy sector yeah. and to be able to bring in other players. The private sector is coming in in leaps and bounds to invest. And a good and growing economy needs that. And that is what we are repositioning our economy to be. Because we are building the economy of the future. We are going through pangs and pains at the moment. For instance, this has also given us the opportunity to look at the green economy. Yeah. This has also given us a chance to look at a just transition. I mean, like, you know, listening to Ramaphosa, one thing that I really hate, it is the fact that President Ramaphosa will not acknowledge the, the problems that are facing the country. I think this is the biggest problem that people are having with President Ramaphosa, the fact that the man will simply not acknowledge the problems that are facing the country. I mean, like, if you were to say, I mean, like, President, if you sit down and address the nation, I mean, at least acknowledge the problems that the country is facing. At least acknowledge that your administration has done a terrible job. At least acknowledge that. But you cannot sit there and pretend like you have done a wonderful job. You cannot sit here and pretend like South Africa is better today under your administration. The people on the streets can tell you a different story. The people on the streets, I can tell you a different story, man. It's unfortunate that today, many people man, are relying on the social grants in South Africa. So they actually don't care about the kind of work they are doing. As, much, as long as they get their social grants, they are okay. They don't care that you are doing a terrible job as the president. But if you were to talk to level-headed South Africans, if you were to talk with people who are actually working in the country, they will tell you that you are doing a terrible job. But how can you sit there as the president of the country, man, and pretend like everything is still okay? How can you sit there as the president of the country, man, and say, the African National Congress under your administration has done a good job. This is the reason why many people are actually pissed with you. This is the reason why people are pissed off with you, man. The investments that we are attracting, including getting 
various countries in the world to still see us as a destination for investment is an important fact because they would not have backed us on the just economy, uh, just uh, transition process if they did not see hope in us, a good future in us. So they are prepared to back us, to pour money into this economy because they can see that we are rebuilding. The reforms that we have embarked upon for our rail, which had been also Slow. affected, affected, yes, by poor years of transit, perhaps. poor appointments, we will admit all that. And that is exactly what we are seeking and doing to change. So change is underway. We are moving leaps by leaps and bounds to reform our economy, to introduce reform. I mean, on things like that had gone on for a long time. For instance, if you wanted to apply for a water license, yeah. you waited three years. Today, you will get your water license within, say, 60 days or 70 days. But for a mining days. license, apparently you also wait three years still now. Yeah, no, no, but on mining Recent license, we, we are actually... Backlog of about 3,000 mining applications. There has the been process. a backlog because we've been waiting for the cadastral system. Cadastral system that is going to wipe out all those uh, backlogs and be able to reposition our money, uh, mining license issuance. So many of these things mm. are under repair. We are reforming ourselves, we are rebuilding ourselves, and we are recovering. <laughs> I have the fullest confidence that we are going to land in a good space because we know what has gone wrong and much of what has gone wrong we have put right we have <coughs> changed the trajectory <laughs> we were on a bad path and sometimes I so, just it wish be, so it was better it's better now that you're here mr president the reason why i ask you all these things is because there's also a sense that you don't follow up on issues mm -hmm. i'll give you an example yes ma'am two years ago at sona you said to us a social compact would be ready within a hundred days yes next week you have a sona it will be two years and we have not seen that social compact you promised bullet trains you promised us a university <laughs> He also promised a smart city, man. Come up as a promised a lot of people, a lot of things in this country. <laughs> you remember when President Ramaphosa was talking about smart city, man? Today we don't even have electricity, man. We don't even have we don't even have leverage to talk about the smart city because we don't even have electricity in the country. <laughs> Ramaphosa has made a lot of promises, man. I, I saw a video where Ramaphosa was talking with the Shembe church members, promising them houses. So Ramaphosa is still continuing, promising people things. He promised South Africa a lot of things, man. <laughs> In Ekurleni, you promised us many things, Mr. Yes. President. Well. They have not come to fruition. In fact, Mr. President, when you were Deputy President, you were the chair of that war room at ESCOM. So, yes. why would you make poor appointments if you had five years to observe, to learn, to see, and by the time you come in, you just implement? Well, no, no. Let, let, let me let me actually go through some of the issues that yes. you have mentioned. For instance, the social compact. I did say it was uh, a, a period when I really thought we would have it in hand in a short space of time. It was not the case. And it was not the case because at, the mo at that time, we didn't really have anything tangible that we could craft a social compact around. What do you mean? We now have, for instance, yes. we now have a compact with labor, and with business around tangible issues. For instance, with business, we are working together at a very deep level on issues like energy, on issues like logistics, and on issues like crime and corruption. Now, you could have a compact that is an empty shell, yeah. but now we have a, a compact that is real and practical where we are working together on an ongoing basis and where I meet business community government every six weeks. With labor, we are able to meet to discuss issues of policy, issues that matter to labor. Those are practical issues. 
And all that now remains, uh, let me start off by saying, and we've had sector compacts. Yes. Sector compacts where we've been working together. And I have no doubt whatsoever that all this makes up the real key elements of what a compact should look like. And maybe what we thought, maybe we're too ambitious by thinking that we will have a compact. And even then, I think it would have been an empty compact. Now we have the ingredients, the real rich ingredients of a real compact. Talk about, say, for instance, a bullet train. We are now at a stage where we are going to have, and cabinet has been going through that process, we are now going to have trains from Johannesburg to Durban, from uh, Johannesburg to the, to, uh, to, the, to the Limpopo province, where we are now looking at uh, even saying we now want a tender to look at any of these corridors to be started off, any one of the two to be started off for the train service. Now, that is the progress possibly that is not seen out there by the public, but it is some of these things do take quite a long but time. But you need electricity for them. Well, you were the, the chair of the war room. Well, the chair of the war room, I mean, that <laughs> in itself is a misnomer because okay. I got to a point where mm -hmm. when I saw that there was not much being achieved, I went to President Zuma and I said, yes. I want to get out of this. I want to get out of this. And I said, appoint a CEO, a certain gentleman as a CEO. Yes to be the only entry person into ESCOM because we had multiple entries into ESCOM. We had the war room, we had the chairman of ESCOM, we yes. had the CEO, we had this one and the ministry and so forth. And I said, it doesn't work. I said, I want to stop this role because it is leading us nowhere. Get one person who must be responsible and be the entry point. And he went ahead and appointed someone who then became the, the, CEO, the key CEO of ESCOM. So that role, for instance, it was a role that was not really impactful, if I may say so. Okay. It wasn't impactful. And that is why I took the initiative to say, I'd like to stop in this role. Because if it was an impactful role, I would have said, yes, I want to continue. But I went forward and said, no, I want to stop. Uh, nobody ever says, I want to stop a thing that, you know, sort of gives them a, a position or whatever. Yeah. So what I'm saying is that these have been years of recovery. <laughs> and there are times when I wish you know, one can fully explain the damage that had been done. What's stopping you from explaining this? No, no, I... I, I <laughs> oh, I... <laughs> <laughs> that is a perfect question, man. And that is a perfect question. What is stopping you from actually explaining to South Africans this damage that you are talking about? What is stopping you? <laughs> are you shielding? No, no, I'm not shielding anyone. <laughs> and I just, I just need to explain the, 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 the real nuts and bolts. Mm. Because when I say the damage that had been done, for instance, to SARS, earlier today I was talking to uh, President uh, Thabo Mbeki, and we were talking about what was done in SARS. Yes. And he is even more descriptive because he has studied the Nugen report in such depth, and he goes through every element of it. And I said, President, that's precisely what we have had to deal with. And the corrective measure that I took when I dismissed the then CEO, and instituted the Commission of Inquiry was to actually stop state capture and to go into some depth of what... Yeah, but I don't know why President keeps talking about stopping the state capture, man. This is nothing but a political rhetoric. It is nothing but a political rhetoric, man. How can Ramaphosa go on a national television and say that they have actually stopped the state capture? How can they say that? Wrong had been done there. So we stopped that. We plugged mm. that hole and the NPA was another, and uh, the Hawks was another, and many of those things that had accumulated to take our country in, on the wrong path. And so it's been rebuilding, recovery, 
and renewal. Mm. And that's what the yeah. five years have constituted. And I do firmly believe that mm. we are now better and well positioned to then take this country forward, particularly also having heeded even the voice from business about the economic reforms that needed to take place because there were so many things that had not been done correctly where we had been dropping the ball yeah. and in some cases the chickens have come home to roost and we are, going, we are having to deal with them so we are on, in that position now of, of perfecting the recovery process and rebuilding and of course COVID did not serve us well I mean, like right now, I feel like <laughs> I feel like the presenter of news room, and she's just sitting there and allowing President Ramaphosa to talk. She's just sitting there and allowing President Ramaphosa to get away with the things. I feel like at this point, the only question that you need to ask the president is that: Do you think South Africa is doing better right now? Do you feel like South Africans are doing better? Do you feel like South Africans have high morale? Do you think that South Africans think that there's a future for them in this country? Those are kind of questions that you really need to ask the president because listening to Ramaphosa right now, he is fighting, he is debating, he is arguing the fact that his administration is doing a good job. He is saying that. And you remember, guys, I said the reason why South Africa is in such a, a, a terrible position is that we have a lot of uneducated voters in South Africa. And these people, I mean, whenever the ANC do these rallies of them, or whenever the ANC does these manifestos, these people, they go out in full force supporting the African National Congress. So do not be surprised when you see the president sitting there and pretending like the African National Congress has done a wonderful job. Why? It's because even people on the ground, they are signaling to Ramaphosa that you are doing a good job. So the president is sitting there naively thinking that I mean, I'm doing a wonderful job. That's why he cannot stand any criticism. That's why Ramaphosa will never acknowledge that South Africa is facing a lot of problems today. So Ramaphosa is sitting there saying that I mean, I've done a wonderful job. My administration have done a wonderful job despite a whole country being a mess despite the whole country being a mess man so i feel like the only questions that the presenter should have actually asked ramaphosa is that man do you feel like right now as we speak the country is doing well under your administration do you feel like right now people have hope that things are going to be better under your administration ramaphosa is defending his legacy man ramaphosa is defending his legacy and i cannot blame him for that <laughs> Ramaphosa is blaming his legacy, man. He's defending his legacy. But he won't acknowledge the problems that are facing the country, man. You know, listening to this interview, this is one thing that I really have a problem with when I'm listening to the president. The fact that he will never acknowledge the problems that are facing South Africa. He will never say, man, South Africa is facing a lot of problems. South Africa is facing a lot of problems. I know today that many people have lost their jobs. I know that today, man, COVID has cost 10 million people to lose their jobs. He's not saying that, guys, I we admit as the African National Congress. He's talking a different language from Fikile Mbalula. You remember Fikile Mbalula said that, guys, we admit, we admit all of our mistakes. All of these things that you are criticizing us of, you are right. You are right to criticize us about all of these things. You are, you are, you are, you are correct to criticize us on those things. But the president is saying no. The president is saying no. We are doing a wonderful job. Your life is better. The people of the the, the, the people in this country, man, their life is better. <laughs> man, listening to the president, man, it's infuriating. It's infuriating listening to the president, man. You sit here, you think about all of the problems that are facing the country. You would think one person, president of the country, would actually acknowledge that, guys, we know that things are bad in the country. We know that, no, he's not acknowledging anything. He's not acknowledging anything. He's saying that his administration is fixing everything that Jacob Zuma broke down. This is what he's saying. When he keeps saying that we had a lot of problems, we were facing a lot of problems, he's talking about Jacob Zuma. He's talking about Jacob Zuma when he says that many things were not done, many recommendations were not actually implemented. He's talking about Jacob Zuma. So Ramaphosa, the only person that he's worried about right now is Jacob Zuma. Guys, we are going to pretend like Jacob Zuma and Ramaphosa, they did not concoct this whole MK thing. We are going to sit here and pretend like this thing, like they did not concoct this whole MK thing. The only person that Ramaphosa is worried about is Jacob Zuma at this point. He doesn't care about his record as the president. 
He doesn't. He wants people to say that Ramaphosa has fixed Jacob Zuma's problems. This is the message that the president is driving to the country that man. Ramaphosa is fixing like like I'm fixing all of the problems <clears throat> that Jacob Zuma caused for the country. But we are one of those countries in the world that dealt so effectively with COVID, but not only in South Africa, but we dealt with the COVID uh, scourge also on our continent, and we did extremely well uh, when it comes to that. Mr. President, on the matter of renewal, let's talk yes. about the party's renewal and yes. the lessons that it's learned. Yes. Because you will say that, but... On the other hand, you'll have instances where we've been told how the ANC has used its majority in Parliament to shield wrongdoing. That happened again, many would argue, when it came to the Palapala report. So what renewal is there? I'm asking this because of the trust deficit that this party is now trying to close almost on a daily basis as you uh, age closer to that 2024 election. Well, renewal is not a one-day event. It never could be a one-day event. A renewal is a process, and I've been uh, explaining this even within the party itself, that sometimes renewal, there will be two steps back and three steps forward. And we keep learning and improving ourselves. And I was saying earlier, for instance, on the issue of uh, 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 dealing with uh, uh, colleagues who are caught up in, say, maybe uh, criminal activity and so forth. We used to say in the ANC, innocent until proven guilty. We now, at a conference of the ANC, changed and said, no, we've got to get do better than that. So that has shown how renewal has been happening. And indeed, that sometimes happens to be so in many other parties. They go through those painful pangs of moving <laughs> forward uh, in dealing with issues of renewal. Mm. So I see that as a process and learning lessons as we move on. And that is precisely where the ANC is. The ANC is by no means perfect, like nobody is perfect. Uh, but at the same time, we are learning and making ourselves better. And I see the ANC being renewed as we move on. So how do you respond to, um, during your <clears throat> tenure, some former leaders saying they might not want to campaign for the ANC? Others no, man, don't say former leaders. Say Jacob Zuma, man. No, not Jacob Zuma. Say Tabumbeg, man. Call him with his name. Tabumbeg is the, is the former leader of the African National Congress who said, man, it's going to be very hard for me to campaign for this Ramaphosa administration. Man, Ramaphosa administration has... Uh, destroyed everything and me as the former president of this country man Tabo Mbeki, man as the one president who actually has a good track record of governing the country i am not going to go out and tell south africans to vote for the african national congress man so why is that why why is she not calling Tabo Mbeki with his name have criticized your leadership mm -hmm. what does that do to you in terms of the ability to lead the organization and instill discipline for an example well, we must accept that in life, uh, we uh, don't always see things the same way. Just like in your own family and my family, we don't see things the same way. Some are oriented towards liking certain things and disliking others. And so in the ANC as well, we, we will have, we will forever have, you know, different views on a number of things. There are certain things that unite us and bind us together and so as we move on it's a question of you know convincing each other and persuading each other as we move on and that is how life goes and uh, so I, I remain confident that as they say in Afrikaans the after osal work and the kral kom the ox that is way at the back will also come into the crawl and that's the level of patience that I have uh, that's the level of confidence that I have that uh, whatever the problems <laughs> are we will find solutions for and I was taught that there is no problem without a solution so all we have to do is to find the solution 
And Mr. President, as you wind down the sixth administration, one would say that the recent case at the International Court of Justice is one of your successes, uh, both from a party president but also a state president level. But I do wonder if you have any <coughs> concerns about the economic ramifications of this David and Goliath case, as some have described it, that we we decided to take on uh, the Goliath and, um, you know, there may be some ramifications after doing that. Does that concern you at all? Was that part of your assessments before actually going to the ICJ? No. First of all, Ramaphosa doesn't care about the ramifications of this case. And we cannot sit here and say that Ramaphosa taking Israel to court, it, it is a victory. It is not a victory. They went to, to, to the court <coughs> and demanded that Israel cease fire against against Palestine. But that, that like the courts did not do that. The courts said that Israel still maintains its position to defend itself. They must just make sure that the people are not in danger. So I don't know why people were actually celebrating the fact that South Africa they got this judgment from the ICJ. This judgment did not actually achieve what these people wanted it to achieve. They wanted this. They wanted ICJ to say that Israel is committing genocide. They wanted ICJ to say that man, we, we are calling for Israel to, 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 to cease fire against Palestine. This is not what they got from ICJ. So I didn't, I'm not going to sit here and pretend like it is a win. How is it a win? How is it a win? Man, you know, this is one of the things that I'm really passionate about when it comes to this Ramaphosa administration and the international affairs. I'm sitting here and thinking, man, why are we there fighting the likes of Israel? Why are we there taking these battles when the people in this country, they are suffering? When the people in this country, they are suffering. <clears throat> How many women in this country, man, they have been taken advantage of? I don't want to mention that word because YouTube might censor this, this. But how many people, I mean, how many men are actually forcing themselves on women on a daily basis in South Africa? How many people are actually killed in South Africa? How many people, I men are poor in this country? How many people don't have water and electricity? How is it okay for our government to go on an international court and say that we want to fight for the people of Palestine to have water and electricity when the people of this country don't have water and electricity? It makes no sense to me. It makes no sense to me, man. I saw Ramaphosa and his ANC cadres dancing, dancing at the judgment of ICJ. How is it going to help the average citizens of this country? How is it going to help the average citizens of this country? Man, you know me. I don't care about what is happening in the country. I don't care what is happening globally, man. This is the reason why I always say I don't care about this whole African unity thing. I don't care if Africa becomes one. I don't care if Africa actually unites. I want South Africa to be okay. I want South Africa to be okay. I don't care if Africa becomes uni. I don't care if Africa is unified or not. I only care about South Africa. I only care about the people of this country. So I don't know why people are celebrating this whole ICJ case as if it's going to help the poor citizens of this country. How much money was actually wasted taking Israel to court to get a judgment saying that Israel, you can continue bombing those people, but just to make sure that the, 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 the civilians are safe. You can, you can continue bombing down Palestine, but just make sure that the citizens are okay. How many millions it took for South African government to take Israel to that court? Don't you think that money could have actually been used to, 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 to help average South Africans in this country? So when these people men, are fighting for the rights of people in Palestine, when are they going to fight for the people, for the rights of the people in this country? When are they going to fight for the safety of the people in this country? When are they going to fight for the unemployment rate that is ravaging the country? When are they going to fight for the crime that is facing the country? When are they going to fight about all of these issues that are facing South Africa today? I don't know why many people are wasting their time on South Africa taking Israel to court. Man. This is one issue that I honestly don't want to talk about because it does nothing to the average South Africans. It does nothing. And for this administration, the administration that can see that millions and millions of South Africans are suffering, for them to take millions and millions of friends taking Israel to court, how is it, how is it a victory? How is it a victory, man? The people in this country, they don't have electricity and water. The people of this country, man, they are living in unsafe, in unsafe communities. People in this country, man, they feel unsafe. 
So for the president of this country man, to take Israel to court and to pretend like South Africa has actually won something, what is it going to do for the average South Africans? What is it going to do for the average South Africans, man? This is the reason why I'm saying that this, the, the, the ANC cadres, man, they, they, they should actually stop entertaining this whole thing of the Israel versus Palestine. Stop entertaining this whole thing of Israel versus Palestine, man. It is not do, doing you any good. It is not doing you any good. You cannot go out and campaign by telling the, the poor South Africans that we took Israel to court. Taking Israel to court basically does nothing for the lives of these people, man. The people are simply trying to survive in this country. So do you think that going to the poor masses of this country, telling them that, guys, we took Israel to court, do you think people are going to be happy and vote for you? Do you think that is actually improving the poor people's lives? It is, it is doing nothing for the poor people in this country. It's doing nothing for the poor people in this country. And me, as a South African taxpayer, I'm actually offended that these people, man, they took my money to take Israel to court. I'm actually offended that these people, man, they took my money to take Israel to court. This case is doing nothing for South Africans. It is not helping South Africans in any way, shape, or form. It is not stopping Israel from doing them. Like, the, like the missions of the Israel men are still going on. Whatever that Israel is trying to achieve with Palestine, man, they are still going on with that. The ICG case and the ruling did nothing when it comes to what is happening in Palestine. It did nothing, man. Israel did not stop nothing. Israel is still doing whatever they need to do. After all, ICJ told them that, guys, you have a right to defend yourselves, but just make sure that the civilians are safe. So Israel is still going to do whatever they want to do. So what was the purpose for South Africa to take Israel to court? What was the purpose for South Africa to take Israel to court? I'm not going to sit here and parade this as a win. It is not a win until every South Africans start winning, until the in unemployment rate start being combated. Like this, this, like this is the only time I can say that, yeah, the government is South African and it's actually doing something. You know, if something can actually be done about the unemployment rate, if something can actually be done about the open borders, if something can be done about crime in this country, man, if this administration can actually fix the hospitals, if this administration can, get, can fix the infrastructure, these are kind of issues that I will say, man, Ramaphosa's administration is really winning. But when it comes to this whole thing of Israel versus Palestine, what is it exactly that average South Africans are gaining from this? What is it exactly that average South Africans are gaining from this? Nothing. They are gaining nothing. It is not a win. Well, every action uh, is always accompanied by some risk. And so in this case as well, there are risks, uh, to be quite honest, but we acted out of principle. We what principle, man? What principle, man? You know, the ANC, when Russia started invading Ukraine, they said that, man, there are reasons why Russia is invading Ukraine. So the ANC on that part, they were pro-invasion. They were pro-invasion. Right now, Hamas, through thousands and thousands of rockets into Israel and Israel said man we are going to respond to you harshly the NC says no no you cannot do that man what you are doing in in in, in Palestine it is genocide so how is it possible for these people man to support war on one side and to be against war on the next side it's either you are against war or it's either you are for war or you are against war it's either you are pro-invasion or not pro-invasion. You cannot come here and say that Russia is invading Ukraine. Whenever, when, when people were told about Russia invading Ukraine, the ANC said that we are maintaining a, a, a neutral stance. We don't want war. We, we were going to, to Ukraine to talk with the president of Ukraine to try to talk him out of this war. And after that, we are going to Russia to talk with the president of Russia to, to, to try to talk him out of this war. But when it comes to Israel and Palestine, they're saying no. Israel is completely wrong. Israel is completely wrong. So how is it possible for these people, man, to favor war on one side and to be against war on the other side? Right now, everyone can tell you how many children died in Palestine, how many people were killed in Palestine, but the same people cannot tell you how many people were died in Ukraine, how many people, how many children were actually died in Ukraine when Russia invaded Ukraine. So it's either these people men are pro-war or they're against war. You cannot tell me that you are against war on this side, but you are pro-war on this side. You, 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 you have morals when it comes to this side, but you don't have morals when it comes to this side. Talking about Russia and Ukraine, these people said that, yeah, Russia has a right to invade Ukraine.
Russia is Russia man wants to be like Ukraine wants to be in NATO. Russia cannot afford, cannot afford for Ukraine to be in NATO. They had all the excuses of why Russia actually invaded Ukraine. They had all the excuses. But right now you're looking at what is happening in Palestine and Israel. No one is saying none of these people are saying guys. I mean uh, throwing thousand rockets into Israel. I mean clearly. I mean like guys, if we were to be honest, what did Hamas think is what was going to happen? What did Hamas think was going to happen when they threw? thousands and thousands of rockets into israel did these people man think that the israel military is going to be like yeah it is fine we've been oppressing these people for such a long time so we are not going to do anything about these people of course they're not going to do that of course they're not going to do that so this whole thing of south africa taking israel to court i mean like it makes no sense it makes no sense it makes no sense going around in the world pretending like we are some sort of superpower. It makes no sense. If anything, you guys are putting South Africa in danger. You are putting South Africa in danger. You know very well that South Africa has no security. You know very well that we don't have the borders. You know very well that our South African military, it, it is nonsense. But here you are taking the one of the biggest military countries in the world, taking them all, taking them to ICJ, taking them to ICJ. I don't like I don't understand what was the purpose of these people man what was the purpose because if you are going to argue that South Africa was okay for taking Israel to court like tell me how did it benefit the poor people of this country how did it benefit the poor people of this country yeah Thomas do not talk about uh, uh, affecting the poor people of this country this is an international manner South Africa has to maintain their sport on an international stage man your international stage is costing this country millions and millions of friends and that money could have actually been used to improve the poor people's lives in this country but instead you took Israel to court guys it is not going to, to, to yield any positive results for South Africa. Taking Israel to court, it is not going to yield any positive results for South Africa. Because at the end of the day, the, the lives of average South Africans it is not, are not improved. The lives of average South Africans, man, it is not improved by this, by this decision to take Israel to court. It is not improved. He acted out of a deep, felt, and seated principle where as we observe the situation of the Palestinians, we saw in them their suffering, a reflection of what we have gone through. And I mean, like, 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 do you even think about the suffering of your own people in this country? Do you think about the suffering of poor South Africans in this country? Do you know the conditions that South Africans are expected to live in? You know, as a president of the country, showing concern for Palestine in term, in, instead of your own country. Do you know how that makes you look? Do you know how that makes you look? The fact that you care about Palestine, the fact that you are emotional when you are talking about Palestine, but you are not emotional when you are talking about the problems that are facing South Africa. You are not emotional when you are talking about the, the issues that are facing South Africa. You are talking about the suffering of the people of Palestine. How about the suffering of the people in this country? How about that? How about that, man? 60% of young people in this country, they cannot even find employment. Young people in this country, man, they are taking their own lives because there are no jobs in South Africa. Young people, they go to school, they attain their degrees, they attain their diplomas, and guess what? The same people, they go back home to sit at home. And now, you have a situation where a lot of graduates are nothing but drunkards, nothing but drug addicts, and you have a president of the country going around saying that, guys, as the president of South Africa, we are going to fight for Palestine. When are you guys are going to fight for south africa when are you guys going to show the same compassion when it comes to the issues that are facing south africa when are you going to put south africa first you are not putting south africa first you are not putting south africa first believing in solidarity and believing in human rights human rights which underpins our foreign policy or international relations I mean, like, one of the reasons why I keep saying that these guys, they must leave all of these issues outside of South Africa alone, it is because Ramaphosa, the same person, you know, like, this is why I'm so upset when I'm talking about these people, man. Ramaphosa, the same person who supported ZANU-PF and Munangagwa, you know, guys, after Zimbabwe had their elections, Munangagwa was actually accused of rigging the elections. And when the investigations were still continuing, Munangagwa decided to inaugurate himself. 
Mnangagwa decided to inaugurate himself. And guess what? President Ramaphosa went there and supported Mnangagwa despite many African presidents saying that, guys, I am not going to go there. That inauguration is a shame and we are going to wait for the result of the SADC mission team that actually went to Zimbabwe. But President Ramaphosa went to Zimbabwe. So how, how can President Ramaphosa sit there and say that, guys, I am worried about the human conditions of the people in Palestine? And he says nothing about the human conditions of the people in Zimbabwe. How is it possible that you can support ZANU-PF, the same administration that is responsible for Zimbabweans leaving their own homeland, but the same time you are talking about that we are standing for Palestine because the rights of Palestinians, they have been violated. When are you going to talk about the rights of the people in Zimbabwe that have been violated by ZANU-PF? How is it possible that you can support ZANU-PF on the side, but at the same time you say you are against Israel? How is it possible? How is it possible? You know what ZANU-PF did to Zimbabwe. Right now, Zimbabweans are scattered all over Africa, and that is the fault of ZANU-PF, and you are supporting ZANU-PF. How is it possible that you can support ZANU-PF on one side and be against Israel on, on the other side? How is it possible? How is it possible? You cannot talk about the human rights. You cannot say that you are an advocate for the human rights because if you were an advocate for the human rights, you would actually talk about the countries like Zimbabwe. You would actually stand against Zimbabwe and what the administration in Zimbabwe is doing to that poor people. You would actually stand against that. But no, you are not saying nothing when it comes to Zimbabwe. I support you guys. It doesn't matter. I don't care that millions and millions of Zimbabwe have actually left Zimbabwe to go into South Africa. I am going to support you guys as the president of the country. I don't care about the human rights of the people in Zimbabwe. But now, no, I care about the human rights of people in Palestine. I am not going to support Israel on what they did. I mean, guys, this is nothing but straight hypocrisy. It is straight hypocrisy. You can't tell me that you support ZANU-PF with what they are doing in Zimbabwe. At the same time, you are against Israel with what they are doing in Palestine. You can't tell me that, man. You can't. You can't. That's why I'm telling you that it's either you are pro-war or you are against war. It's either you are pro-invasion or you are against the pro-invasion. It's either you are against the human rights or you are for human rights. You cannot take, you cannot take your cake and eat it, man. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You can't have your cake and eat it. And also remembering what Nelson Mandela taught us, that the freedom, our freedom will never be complete until the freedom of the Palestinians is also achieved. And having raised the issue as the killings were happening in Gaza, and even approached the Israeli government that this is looking like a genocide, could you stop? And we Man, when are you going to talk about the genocide that is happening in South Africa? I mean, thousands and thousands of South Africans are being murdered in the streets of this country. Man. Thousands and thousands of people, man. We are competing with the countries that are facing the war. The way people are dying in South Africa. We are competing with the countries that are facing the war. When are you going to talk about the genocide that criminals men are committing in South Africa? When are you going to talk about that? When are you going to talk about these people, men, who are forcing themselves on women? When are you going to talk about the children being abducted in South Africa? These are kind of issues that you, as the president, you should be focused on. But no, you don't care about the issues that are facing South Africa. You care about Israel and the issues that are facing Palestine. We raised it at the UN at many other forums. And when that was not heeded, because of our own history, because the suffering that the Palestinians are going through is no different. Of, of course, I think they are going through much worse than we did. There was no real active, you know, direct killing of genocide like we went with bombs and fighter jets bombing. But we felt that it touched our souls and we needed to respond. And the response that we felt we needed to take was not to take up arms and go and defend them, yeah. but to go to an international institution, to speak in the, in, uh, um, in the United yeah. Nations, and to also go and speak in the court. And this is a court that many of those countries in the West set up. They, they put that court together, and we decided to go there because... I mean, like, you know, when, 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 when you are thinking about all of these things, you are sitting and thinking, why does South Africa care about what is happening in Palestine? Why do we even give airtime to what is happening in Palestine when we have so many issues that are facing South Africa? 
Why do we even care? Why do we even care, man? You know, if I was the president of the country, man, I would put South Africa first. I would put South Africa first, man. You know, this is one of the things that actually made Donald Trump popular in the United States. Donald Trump got there and said that America first. Donald Trump said America first, man. I'm not, I don't care about what is happening in the world. I don't care about what is happening in the world, man. I'm going to put America first. This is what Donald Trump said. And this is the reason why many Americans actually follow Donald Trump. Because they said for once, at least we have a president that actually cares about the country. At least for once, we actually have a problem. The president that is going to look at the issues that are facing our country. When are these people actually going to focus on South Africa, man? I've never seen so, so many people, man, celebrating a non-win. Celebrating a non-win, man. The NC cadres were dancing, dancing, and, and, and everything. As if this whole move was going to help the poor citizens of this country. I thought these people, man, being in government, the purpose of these people being in government was to help the poor citizens of this country. But no. But no, they are focusing on Israel while South Africa is facing so many problems. This is the reason why I'm not going to celebrate this thing. This is the reason why I've been avoiding to talk about South Africa taking israel to court because i know that i'm going to be upset because i know the problems that are facing the country and the fact that these people men are, are ignoring all the problems that are facing south africa and talking about this issue of israel men it makes me mad it makes me my <laughs> my blood boils man my blood boils man you know as an average south african man i take offense when i hear a south african president saying that we are going to make sure that the people of palestine have water and electricity i take offense when the when the president of the country say that we are going to make sure that the people of palestine they are safe I'm like, man, when are you going to make sure that the people of this country have water and electricity? When are you going to make sure that the people of this country, they are safe? This is why I take offense. This is why I take offense. And I don't understand why the hell did we entangle ourselves with the whole Israel versus Palestine thing. These people, man, have been fighting for thousands of years for us to think that we have solutions to what is facing Israel and Palestine. Man, it's naive. Israel and Palestine, man, these people have been fighting for thousands and thousands of years for us to sit here and pretend like we, can, we have solutions to what is facing Israel and Palestine. It is naive. It is naive, man. If you really wanted to win if you really wanted to win the favor of South Africans, man, I'm telling you, you should have focused on the issues that are facing South Africa. You should have focused on the issues that are facing South Africa, but that is not what you are doing. You are not doing that. Courts are arbiters in disputes. And so we took a simple and straightforward action. If we had taken up arms to go and fight against Israel and Gaza, I would have said, yes, maybe there could be a punishment against us. Mm. But we just took an ordinary step of going. And guys, you need to understand that that, that punishment that Ramaphosa is talking about is going to affect the poor citizens of this country. And this is why I'm mad. This is why I'm mad. This is why I'm mad. That punishment that the president is talking about, the poor citizens of this country, they are the ones who will be faced with this punishment. The comrades will always be fine. The comrades will always be fine. This is why today many people will tell you that Zimbabwe it is not thriving because of the Western sanctions on the country. The Zalo PF cadres are still living a nice life. The poor citizens of Zimbabwe are the ones facing hell of the sanctions. The Zalo PF cadres they are still okay. You saw with that gold mafia in documentary. The Zalo PF cadres are still okay. They are selling the mineral resources of the country. They are driving the nicest cars, living in the most nicest houses. But the poor citizens of Zimbabwe are the ones facing hell. So Ramaphosa doesn't care about the quote-unquote punishment that is heading towards South Africa. He doesn't care about that. You know why? Because the comrades will always be fine. The comrades will always be fine. They are not going to feel it. But you are going to feel it. As an average South Africa, you are going to feel it. They are not going to feel it because they are the comrades. They will, be, they will always be fine. To a court to go and put forward a case. And a case which we persuaded the judges to listen to. So in the end, the judges are the ones who took the decision. So how far are we, Mr. President, your executive, in considering the closure of the Israel, Israeli embassy here in South Africa? Our parliament took a resolution. Yes to get the executive to consider yes. the Welcome decision that they have taken. So that is still under consideration. But the executive took 
a much more bolder uh, decision of going to the International Court of Justice and the issue of uh, the resolution that they took, they took in Parliament is still under consideration. It's a matter that will be considered. But we were much more direct and bold in taking the decision that we took, mm -hmm. which we hope uh, is recognized by South Africans. And in fact, many South Africans have uh, voiced their opinion in support of what uh, the government has done. And Stop lying, Ramaphosa, man. Stop lying. The people of this country, they want you to improve their lives. Average South Africans don't care if South Africa takes Israel to court. Average South Africans don't care about that. So don't say that many South Africans actually expressed their support to South Africa. Men, people don't care about that. People are simply trying to survive in this country. People are trying to survive. So for you to say that, man, the poor people in this country, they support us taking Israel to court. That is false. We are very pleased that we had, uh, we have uh, uh, an outstanding legal team that represented us, and including our Minister of Justice. Uh, young as he is, he stood in the International Forum and represented us, and Minister Pandre as well, who also went. So. You're winding down your sixth administration at SONA next week. Are you giving us an <coughs> election date? The election date will be announced soon. Uh, we're still in the, the time frame to be able to hold our elections and we will follow the precepts of our constitution so an election date will be announced soon. All right, Mr. When do you want it to be? Preferably not in winter. <laughs> <laughs> so guys, I don't know man, I don't know what do you think about this interview of President Ramaphosa. I, mean, I honestly think that the president has evaded all the questions that were proposed to him. The president simply went there to campaign for the African National Congress, she, he, he, he actually didn't care about the problems that were the, about the, the the questions that were posed to him. He simply went there to to talk his talking points. This is how I feel about the interview, guys. Please tell me what you think on the comment section. Don't forget to hit that like button, and the most important part is subscribe, subscribe, subscribe. My name is Thomas Mabaso. I will see you next time. Bye bye.